Everyone, uh, thanks for, thank you for attending this evening's webinar. My name is Chris Walls. I'm a project manager here with the Vascular Access Society of the Americas. I'd like to thank Medtronic and the Renal Care Solutions Division for sponsoring this evening's webinar. And I'd like to introduce Anthony Campagna, project manager for the peritoneal dialysis portfolio at Medtronic. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Vasa, for uh, sponsoring, co-sponsoring this webinar series here. Uh, we're very excited to have everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a very exciting topic tonight uh, with pre-sternal catheter use and um, patient care. Tonight we have with us Dr. Haggerty, who is a senior attending physician out of the North Shore University Health System in Evanston, Illinois. He has an academic affiliation with the University of Chicago as well. He has a particular interest in laparoscopic PD catheter insertion for about 20 years and has given many presentations, published several peer-reviewed articles, and edited one book on the subject. So he's fairly invested, uh, and we're very excited to have him joining us tonight um, and definitely take advantage of having him here to answer your questions. Um, Dr. Haggerty has received his medical degree from the University of Missouri-Columbia and completed his general surgery residency at the Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago. He's currently in an academic group practice involving clinical research, resident and student education, and maintains a busy, minimally invasive practice. So like I said, no further introduction needed. Dr. Haggerty, take it away. Thank you for joining us tonight. And like I said, everybody, um, use this opportunity to ask questions um, and take advantage of the time. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, thanks for inviting me and thanks everybody for joining us for this webinar. Um, <clears throat> so it's gonna be very informal. I'm gonna go through uh, some slides. We'll, we'll stop along the way to, to take a lot of questions. Uh, can everybody see the screen okay? We don't have it yet. So, um, the disclaimer is uh, that uh, I am obviously a consultant for Medtronic and I'm also a consultant for Cineos Health. Um, and the medical techniques and procedures here don't represent all medically acceptable protocols. They are just intended uh, for educational purposes and they're not to be substituted for each individual physician's experience and judgment in treating a patient. So this presentation is gonna kind of overview. Um, so we're gonna um, just talk about a lot about the importance of the uh, insertion procedure and attention to details to uh, give the patient the best outcome. Um, we're gonna go over the physicians who commonly insert catheters. Uh, we're gonna talk about techniques specifically about pre-sternal insertion. Uh, I can take a lot of questions during that time and we have, um, you know, some of the indications for uh, that type of catheter, as well as the assessment of patients and to determine who's going to be the best, uh, what type of catheter is going to be the best for each individual patient. And um, we have some data on the outcomes and some current marketing dynamics. So the, uh, you know, the proper planning and, and uh, placement of a catheter actually starts with the office consultation. And uh, for me, when I see a patient, you know, I see everybody in my office, we do as most people do, uh, you know, get their complete history and uh, do a physical exam. And I'm gonna focus on their cardiac status, begin um, assessing their risk for anesthesia. As uh, Anthony said, I do a mostly laparoscopic surgery and that requires general anesthesia. So <clears throat> we do that office assessment. Uh, we assess for what their prior surgical history is. We do a thorough exam um, regarding, um, you know, looking for specific, specifically for hernias and surgical scars. And then we assess the body habitus. Um, as you can see here, we start, you know, assessing their body habitus at this visit, including the, you know, belt location. Um, and if they're, you know, and that's how we're gonna decide what length and type of catheter might be the best for them. And I do have some pictures about this later on in the presentation. Um, 
and then and as well as you know we'll go over the pre the uh, tunneling and all that in the, in the later on. Um, and this is of course in this office visit where we assess we explain the procedure to the patient um, and begin the the pre-op process, in, including you know potentially uh, using enemas or bowel prep if they've had a history of constipation. So when I see patients, um, most of the time they've been sent to me by the nephrologist, but occasionally we do have to uh, decide if they have any absolute or relative contraindications to perineal dialysis. Um, some of the noted absolute contraindications are uh, documented membrane failure, um, decreased peritoneal capacity, which uh, generally uh, happens from loculations or adhesions from prior surgery. Um, if the patient has had unresolved peritonitis, then that's you know obviously a contraindication. The um, patients have to have the ability to safely use the equipment, and that means the co cognitive function as well as sometimes they have to have good you know enough good vision to hook up the equipment, uh, or they need a spouse or family or adequate assistance in that. Um, and a lot of times we rely on the, uh, the PD nurse and PD um, outpatient centers to assess the patient for this. Usually we've had them see the patient for uh, teaching and uh, review before I even see them. The, if the patient has had an active abdominal wall infection or skin infection, then that's a contraindication to place a new catheter. Um, extensive intra-abdominal adhesions are um, a contraindication, but a lot of times that can't be assessed until we operate. So I will be relatively liberal in, um, in setting someone up for a laparoscopic surgery and taking a look. Um, it's difficult to predict who's gonna have a lot of adhesions or, or enough adhesions that would prevent catheter function. Uh, frequent episodes of diverticulitis obviously can infect uh, and cause peritonitis. Uncorrectable mechanical defects are basically large ventral hernias. And again, some of them, you know, we can be aggressive with repairing uh, abdominal hernias, especially with some of our techniques for retrorectus mesh and, uh, and, and keeping the peritoneum intact. Um, and so that just depends on the expertise of the surgeon and severe respiratory insufficiency. Relative contraindications, um, de decreased capacity of the, of the abdominal wall, again, that's relative because sometimes those defects can be fixed. Obesity is, uh, you know, on, in some teachings, obesity is a relative contraindication, but there's been a few papers, including some data from our own institution that show obesity should not be a contraindication to peritoneal dialysis. Um, Inter-abdominal foreign bodies, uh, generally for bariatric, such as a lap band, we have seen people uh, do adequate PD with that. And if they've had an abdominal aortic aneurysm graft, they could do PD after about a four month recovery. Um, ostomies are not a um, absolute contraindication. And this uh, is where pre-sternal catheters a lot of times are beneficial in keeping the exit side away from the ostomy. <clears throat> Inability to tolerate general anesthesia is probably a contraindication to laparoscopic insertion, but for open or interventional radiology insertion, um, that's a case-by-case -case basis. And, um, and generally, you know, patients can get a percutaneous insertion, even if they have uh, you know, relatively high uh, comorbidities. So the surgeons, this, the physicians that we are generally reaching out to uh, are mostly general surgeons, uh, but vascular surgeons, uh, interventional nephrologists, transplant surgeons, and uh, are all doing peritoneal dialysis catheter insertion, both with open and peritoneoscopic techniques and percutaneous. And interventional radiology insertion is a very, is a growing technique across the United States, um, depending on the institution. 
And this kind of shows a breakdown. Um, you know, this data is from a few years ago, but about a quarter of the insertion is still open surgical. Over 50% are laparoscopic, and this is both could be basic or what we call advanced laparoscopic insertion. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, peritoneoscopic is a form of uh, uh, visualization using a scope that's generally um, you know, not performed very often. And then fluoroscopic guided percutaneous seems to be the most, uh, you know, the most growing uh, way to insert these catheters as more interventional radiologists are being trained and taking this on. So um, I do advanced laparoscopic uh, insertion. This is something that I've been doing for many years. We published on it. Um, it's been, there's been a, a recent meta-analysis with work from uh, John Crabtree and the Cleveland Clinic and our data um, showing that this, this type of insertion does lead to the uh, lowest rate of catheter dysfunction. And that's really what we're looking for. So what the advanced laparoscopic is compared to basic laparoscopic is, is procedures or adjunct procedures performed by the surgeon to decrease the um, risk of outflow dysfunction. And those generally are rectus sheath tunneling, which um, produces a uh, orientation of the catheter towards the pelvis and prevents migration. Omentopexy, which uh, um, sutures the omentum in the upper abdomen to avoid omental entrapment. Adhesiolysis to um, prevent it he you know prevent compartmentalization of the abdomen and then it's also been described some even more uh, advanced techniques like colopexy pexying the sigmoid colon to the lateral sidewall to keep it out of the pelvis uh, removing apoploic appendages uh, even um, um, pexying the uh, uh, the epiploic appendages will help sometimes with catheter dysfunction where you know basic laparoscopy, has been described in several papers and that's just using the laparoscope to look at the abdomen and sort of watch the catheter as it's put in and then um, removing the, the scope. Fluoroscopic guided insertion um, is generally performed by either interventional nephrologist or radiologist. This is done in radiology suite, not in the operating room, can be done under, under a sedation um, it's usually ultrasound guidance to um, <clears throat> avoid the epigastric vessels and uh, avoid the and reduce the risk of bowel perforation. It uh, then is done with um, Selninger technique and fluoroscopic guidance to make sure that the wire and then the catheter are deep in the pelvis. There, it's the least invasive uh, way to insert these catheters. So especially in high risk patients, it's very good. Um, however, there is no direct visualization of the abdomen. It may be less effective in patients with prior abdominal surgery. And certainly it's not, a, we're not able to do uh, any kind of tunneling or omentopexy during that procedure. I'd like to um, open the floor to questions about um, these type of insertion techniques. If anyone has questions, they can either, yeah, okay, we have one person raising their hand. I will promote them. Hold on one second. Sorry, trying to figure out how to. All right, John Lucas, should you should be able to uh, ask your question. That it, dividing adhesions is a permanent solution to that problem, or do they recur? And if you do divide them, do you need to instill fluid and keep them sort of full till those raw surfaces heal? That's a great question. Um, if it's, it depends on the how extensive the adhesions are. Um, I have done, you know, some major adhesiolysis with patients who have had multiple prior operations. And those are the patients that 
it may work best to um, put them in the hospital and do a 500 milliliter flush the next day, one or two. Uh, and then if you can set it up for frequent flushing, that helps prevent the recurrence. It also flushes the blood out because usually the first few flushes, you know, the fluid's pretty pink if you've had to do a lot of adhesiolysis. So you're right. It, I think it does help. I don't have a research paper on that, but um, I think it does help to, to flush them frequently and maybe leave a little fluid in after. Thank you. <clears throat> Looks like Dr. Sequera also has a question. Would you like to go ahead, Dr. Yeah. I can no, also that, uh, that, that was a mistake, so I'm sorry. Oh, okay, no worries. I can, there's a couple in the chat. Um, as far as the functionality and the survivability, I mean, there's, 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 there's um, survival curves showing the advanced laparoscopic has a longer survival, and that kind of makes sense if there's less dysfunction. Um, you know, the fluoroscopic, we actually through SAGES, which is our laparoscopic society, where I'm on the guideline committee and we're looking at some new, um, some new um, systematic review on fluoroscopic guided percutaneous insertion versus laparoscopic. But um, so the long-term data on the fluoroscopic is not out regarding um, that, but most of the papers that I've seen show fairly equivalent um, long-term survival if the patient had not had prior abdominal surgery. The um, answer to the second question by Paul, by, by Dr. Burgett is that, yes, I would take a look. Uh, a lot of times, even if some, you know, if someone's had a prior mesh, they are gonna have adhesion to that mesh, even if it's coated mesh. So I would, I would say that you lice those adhesions and then you can place the catheter. Most of the dialysis actually occurs in the pelvic peritoneum and along the right and left gutters. So the interabdominal wall, if there's mesh there, that peritoneum may not have the vascularity, but it, it should be okay to do PD. Um, there's another question, uh, yeah. So the next question is what type of radiology training is available for new providers wanting to do this work? Or I think that I, th there's um, something called Peritoneal Dialysis University or PDU that um, does have an interventional radiology course as well as a surgeon's course. And they've divided that into two different sections. Um, I think um, otherwise it has to come through the IR um, societies and, and usually fellowship. <clears throat> so the question is, is a hernia a contraindication for fluoroscopic insertion? Well, I mean, hernias need to be repaired either at the time of a PD catheter insertion or um, or before it. So I, what I usually do is repair the hernia and put the catheter in, allow that to heal for two to four weeks and then start PD. So, um, so the presence of a hernia is a contraindication to starting peritoneal dialysis because there's a high, high incidence of fluid leak out the hernia sac and then you can get scrotal edema or, or abdominal wall edema. I think we can move on. Yep, I would say so. And, and we'll, we'll catch up with questions if any more come in. Yeah. Okay, so um, after we've decided, you know, after we've seen the patient in the office, um, I'm typically gonna talk to them about either extended uh, upper abdominal catheter, pre-sternal catheter or regular um, catheter. And if you can see my cursor, these, this just kind of shows the different options. So pre-sternal comes out in the, in the sternal area. Um, upper abdominal is usually subcostal. So, um, you know, usually in the upper uh, quadrant. And then the, the standard catheters are usually coming out somewhere in the uh, lateral or lower quadrant. Um, 
And then this shows what we might do in the operating room to mark the patient um, as seen and published by John Crabtree. Um, it, we want to try to determine the uh, insertion site, which is where the deep cuff would go, and then the exit site in a way that the exit site, you know, the catheter, the cuff, external cuff would be two to three centimeters away from the exit site, and that prevents cuff extrusion in the future. Um, and that can depend on whether you have are using a um, swan neck catheter or a straight catheter. And this diagram in over here shows if you have a straight catheter, you would sort of hold the hold where the cuff is and then go two centimeters um, distal to the cuff and then swing the catheter lateral. And your exit site can be along that arc. Um, as the other Exit sites, again, we're gonna plan that either in the upper abdomen or presternal and away from the distal cuff. So um, we're gonna show some pictures of the extended catheter, but that's sort of what the talk is mostly centered around. And this allows a lot of flexibility on the exit. So this is a two piece um, catheter set and there's a traditional curl cath, which would be placed and, and one cuff on that part of the cuff of that piece. Um, that's inserted using our standard technique of insertion about in, in the paramedian region. Um, and that can be done laparoscopically, uh, interventional, radi you know, percutaneously, or by open. Uh, and then the extender piece can be cut to various lengths. And there's a titanium catheter in the kit, which is used to connect the two. And so when we're deciding on pre-sternal, which you know, I can admit is not a very large percent of my practice, um, we, it's, it's helpful in patients who have a large panis. We wanna keep the exit site out of that panis where it might have a lot of sweat or even you know, be tucked under. Um, we want to keep it away from an ostomy, prior surgery wounds, and um, actually in pediatrics, keeping it away from the diapers. So, so for large panaces, I will generally do an upper quadrant exit site that's shorter catheter. It tends to be well liked by the patients. For ostomies uh, and patients that have had prior, you know, lower abdominal surgery with a lot with wounds or. Um, or if the patient wants to do tub baths and, 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 and um, submerge in a tub, we have done uh, pre-sternal catheters for that reason, because those come out um, you know, in the sternal area. So some of the disadvantages of pre-sternal placement one is that compared to the regular uh, length catheter, this is this flow is slightly slower because of the increase of length of the catheter. Studies have shown this is pretty much insignificant clinically. Um, there is a possibility of a catheter disconnection in the tunnel, but this is extremely rare as long as the insertion technique is followed and the titanium connector is, is connected to the um, to the catheter pieces and sutured with silk. And then this in insertion technique is a little more challenging. Um, it takes a little experience to get the catheters to be cut correctly uh, so that they're not buckling under the skin. The tunneling is a little more involved and slightly more painful. So it takes a little longer. So if we're going to do preoperative, if we're going to do the uh, pre-sternal, we have the pre-sternal kit. This shows a pre-sternal catheter uh, with the distal piece, titanium connector connected to the, the uh, exit site piece. You can see there's a total of three, three um, cuffs. And this is important to actually to document because if someone else is taking the catheter out after you've put this in, they may not know where the cuffs are. Um, so if, after we've considered the factors such as body habitus, stomas, um, <coughs> and we've chosen the, the, um, 
pre-sternal. Um, I see them in the holding area. I'm gonna have them sit up and lay down so we can really determine um, the good exit site. And, and that is sometimes, I, will may, I may switch my decision from a standard length to a uh, extended catheter in the pre-op holding area after I've had them sit, sit up and uh, see where the panis is. We usually put the catheter exit on the left side. Most kidney transplants go on the right. And occasionally people have to maintain PD a little while while the transplant is, is starting to work. So um, the terminology I think that we wanna use is the um, insertion site is one of our incisions and that's where the deep cuff is going to go. And we determine the insertion site based on the patient's body. Uh, you can, if you have, you know, a sample catheter or a um, stencil kit that can be done in the holding area. Otherwise I usually just do that in the operating room. I lay the catheter over the patient. Um, we usually using IO band to prevent, we don't want the catheter touching the skin. And the, the curl catheter should line up about the top of the pubic symphysis. So the top of the curl lines up to the top of the pubic symphysis. And then that, wherever that uh, deep cuff lies on their skin, I mark that. And that's where I'm gonna make my incision. Um, and then we do um, institute lapars laparoscopy via optical viewing trocar in the subcostal region, usually on the patient's right. And we take a look, we look for hernias, we look for adhesions um, and any other interabdominal pathology, look at the size of the omentum. Um, and then if the patient has a lar large omentum, I do selective omentopexy. So if it's a very small omentum, we won't do that. If it's a large omentum, they will, we'll put a, a, another trocar on the right um, lateral side. I like to use a three millimeter because we have that, otherwise a five bladeless. The omentum's grasped and um, under laparoscopic vision brought into the upper abdomen and um, we use a suture passing device to put a transfascial silk suture through the you know, skin, through the abdominal wall. Then we pierce that omentum, grab the um, silk with a grasper. We take the... Um, insertion needle out, put it back into a different stab, grab the, so pull it back through, tie it down. This anchors the omentum in the upper abdomen. It's very simple. It takes only a few minutes. It's very effective. I've gone back in on patients several times and it, it, it holds well. It start, it just kind of um, and causes an inflammatory adhesion to keep the omentum out of the pelvis. The, um, we then do insert the catheter through either the, um, the catheter insertion kit that comes with the uh, Medtronic kit. It's a sheath and dilator, or occasionally we use an eight millimeter trocar, which is what, because the cuffs will go through an eight millimeter trocar. So if it's an obese patient and the um, sheath and dilator bends or doesn't work well, I switch to an eight millimeter trocar because we want to be able to um, insert through the fa anterior fascia, see the tip of the catheter bulging into the peritoneum, tunnel towards the pelvis for five centimeters before piercing the posterior sheath and peritoneum. This is the rectus sheath tunnel. This keeps the catheter oriented towards the pelvis and um, decreases the catheter uh, flipping into the upper abdomen or, or, or um, becoming malpositioned. And then the, after the sheath is pierced through, the catheter is put through the sheath and dilator or the eight millimeter trocar under direct vision. Uh, we use a grasper to put it where we want it in the deep pelvis. Um, and <clears throat> then the, the breakaway sheath is removed or the eight millimeter sheath is removed, leaving the deep cuff between the anterior and posterior rectus sheaths. So if that, if that is not, you have to sometimes use a... Um, retractor and make sure that that has been pushed through the anterior sheath. If you see the cuff, um, you have to spread the sheath a little and push that cuff to, the cuff um, below it or the catheter can slide out and causing a pseudo hernia and other problems. Um, some people have described suturing 
placing one suture to close the fascia around this cuff. It just depends how big of an opening you had to make. Um, and then um, this is uh, under laparoscopic vision, we are gonna stay medial to the epigastric vessels when we make this insertion site. If you're doing open, uh, it usually would be about three centimeters lateral of the midline and then under direct vision, the catheter is inserted. Um, we close the peritoneum, the anterior sheath, everything. And, um, and then we have our catheter ready to do the presternal hookup. So this shows, now we have to make, for presternal, we're making another incision in the um, uh, chest. And um, generally speaking, if we're on the left side of the abdomen, we're gonna tunnel to the patient's left chest and actually the exit site is going to be medial to the tunnel. So this picture is a little bit off. Um, and that tunnel can be made with a vascular tunneler or sometimes I'll use a long laparoscopic grasper and tunnel up, grab the um, catheter and pull it down to our initial incision. So I will have, um, the catheter we inserted into the abdomen, and then I'll have the presternal piece in my hand. Um, and we want to measure from the upper incision to our lower one and cut the catheters to, um, you know, so they're not redundant catheter. You have to cut them. We first line them up actually before we tunnel it, so outside of the body cut the catheters so that they, uh, when you hook them together, will not be redundant. And I usually take one to two centimeters off, especially if the patient's obese, at least two centimeters, uh, since you're gonna be tunneling and you'll get a little extra. Um, and so then I tunnel it down, I pull it out the incision, attach both ends to the titanium adapter. There's little grooves in the adapter um, to use silk ties so it won't pull apart. And pull the tubing back up through the upper incision to straighten it out. I palpate the tubing in the abdominal wall with my finger. Uh, and then we uh, have our exit side, so a third incision in the upper presternal area to pull out the um, catheter using, using that tunneling device. And again, we do want to make sure that the cuff is two centimeters away from the exit site. That's a lot to digest. I'm sorry that I don't have any videos on that, but I will take chat questions or regular questions about that procedure. Maybe, can we send a poll, Anthony, how many people have actually done a presternal insertion? Um, I don't know if I can do that live. Let me see. Otherwise, I'm happy to go. Um, to answer questions that people are sort of confused about it. We, it's okay, we don't have to do that poll. If people want to chime in about whether they if they've done them and um, or if they have questions about it, this is a good time to do it. We do have one question in the chat. Any issues if the patient has ICD? Is that, what, what do you mean by ICD? Patient. Yeah, um, I mean, you just have to keep, <clears throat> You have to be aware of where that is, um, and and you you should you know you you don't want to um, you don't want to tunnel into the caps capsule that's formed around the defibrillator or pacemaker. Uh, but you know there's plenty of generally those are a little higher in the chest than where you're gonna make your exit site um, because 
you know, you do have to, you don't want to be tunneling this into breast tissue and women. So it'd be um, medi it's just the medial side of the breast and then kind of coming out in the skin of the sternum um, and keeping it a little bit lower so that it wouldn't be high enough to see uh, if they had like a V-neck on or, um, you know, that kind of bra. But it is, it works fine in women or men if you take those into account. That was one of the questions is if the techniques work, works better on men, are you limited by the breast size in women ever? Another kind of um, caveat or trick is knowing, um, you know, you want to stay in the same plane when you're tunneling. You, you don't want to obviously interrupt the anterior sheath and you don't want to be too superficial because um, that can, can you know, kind of, um, that can buckle the skin or um, you can, they can see it and it can be disfiguring. So you kind of want to stay in the same plane and as you're coming over the rib cage that's a little tricky um but you know that that's something that's just technique based and after you've done a few it, it's you know practice based so it looks like there's a, another question around urgent start um is there any additional healing needed no, um, I mean, there's, uh, there ha there's not. Um, I think that, you know, the catheter, we, we find a very low rate of almost no catheter leaks. I think the rectus sheath tunnel and laparoscopic insertion help that. And so we start people, our urgent start is 48 hours after. Um, I don't remember urgent, doing urgent start on a, on a pre-sternal, but I don't think it would matter because it's really the <clears throat> insertion site, how you handle the insertion site that uh, is important in, in avoiding fluid leaks and urgent start. I also was able to launch the poll. So it looks like we have about 90% of the attendees have not placed a presternal catheter before. So about only about two people have in the presentation here. It's not a, I think across the country, it's not, I, I don't know the incidents. I think that's a great research question. I'm gonna go into a little more later on. We can maybe um, um, have the two people that have done them uh, chime in if they want. Any other questions about technique? So um, let's see here. The post-operative care is pretty much the same, no matter what size or shape or uh, design of catheter that we've used. We like to do flushing after one week. Um, and then the optimal start time is two weeks. And that's per the International Society of Parent Neal Dallas's guidelines. Um, I think everyone here might know that, you know, urgent start is becoming popular and it's, there's lots of data showing that it's safe and, you know, it's helpful to patients to keep them off of hemodialysis. So we do have an urgent start program at our hospital where, where we put catheters in as inpatients. And as I said, we, we, we like to get about 48 hours before we start exchanges, but, um, and we do we do do we reduce volume exchanges up to about a liter for a week or two, um, and then they increase their initial volume gradually as tolerated. So it interestingly, uh, there's not a lot of current data. A lot of some of the publications came out of University of Missouri in the early 2000s, um, and this is a study that. Out of 150 catheters, um, 
or, or they filed 150 pre-sternal catheters over 130 patient years, which is pretty good follow-up. The pre-stented catheters tended, pre-sternal catheters tended to perform better than swan neck abdominal catheters regarding exit and tunnel infections. Um, and they were implanted in several patients who, in whom regular catheters with the exit set on the abdomen would be difficult or impossible to implant. So it did increase the availability of peritoneal dialysis in the patients with, uh, you know, ostomies and things like that. Another study in 2010 uh, looked at about five years of data, and they divided the patients into two groups, 22 with um, 20, 23 abdominal catheters and 22 patients with 20. To 21 patients with 22 presternal catheters. Um, and the presternal catheters had a lower risk of infections. Their theory was maybe that the immobilization of the chest uh, decreased exit side infections. Uh, and I think that's uh, reasonable. Um, so, but again, their data was tended to show that, but it wasn't statistically significant. So there's not a lot of actual scientific data on pre-sternal catheters. Um, but again, I think that it is important to have in your armamentarium. Um, and it is something that, you know, like anything, you sort of need some volume to, um, to get good at and to be comfortable with and, and just kind of get over a little bit of a learning curve. And I would suggest that maybe if your hospital is stocking the pre-sternal kits that you are pretty liberal about um, upper abdominal exit site and obese patients, it is higher, uh, it's easier for them sometimes to even see um, and it, it can keep the exit site out of the panis and, and, and be helpful in that regard. So, um, you know, I think it's important that we are spreading the word about peritoneal dialysis and that I'm, that's why I'm on the bandwagon to help people become good uh, at inserting them. It's a, a niche type surgery and um, attention to detail really matters because the patients uh, rely on these catheters. And if they have run into trouble with malfunction, um, infections, problems, they're going to switch over to, he to hemo, and sometimes that can be avoided by strict attention to detail, really understanding um, <clears throat> which insertion techniques are best, understanding that you can be kind of aggressive with lysing adhesions and getting them to work. Um, and, it, and it's something that maybe one or two surgeons in the whole institution should specialize in so that you get higher volume. So the market dynamics are interesting today because Medicare, uh, as, you know, CMS is proposing um, payment models that uh, are going to promote home dialysis. And that's gonna be, you know, I would think 90% PD and only 10% home hemo. Uh, so, you know, it looks like in 2018, um, you know, 12% of the patients hit this national goal and they're hoping that 80% by 2025 are um, either had a transplant or on home dialysis. And, you know, we have a very robust PD program. The patients are, are there's a much higher satisfaction. There's more patient autonomy. It preserves their residual renal function longer. And so I'm really surprised that, you know, the latest numbers I've seen are that PD is used in only about 8% of American patients who are starting renal replacement therapy. So in conclusion, um, you know, peritoneal dialysis uh, catheter exit sites should be individualized. And this starts out by an evaluation in the office um, it typically, we want the exit site to be uh, away from the belt line and um, away from stomas uh, and wound infections and um, things like that. So the options are uh, swan neck catheters to have a below the belt line exit site, 
straight catheters tunneled laterally to have it above the belt line. And that's typically a little more common in men who wear their pants lower. And then pre-sternal and upper abdominal exit sites for patients who have uh, the um, body habits that we've talked about. Thank you all for um, paying attention and being involved. I'm happy to take some more questions. If anyone has questions, feel free to type them into the chat or the Q&A function, or you can raise your hand and I can promote you to a speaker if you'd like. It looks like we actually had one question come in. Um, what is your recommendation on getting the exit site wet with a shower after a six week healing period? Um, yeah, we usually let people shower in four to six weeks, um, depending on how it's healed. So six weeks should be fine, fine for shower. Um, and what happens in our institution is that they go to, um, you know, DeVita or Fresenius and they get the first dressing change and they start getting instruction and the nurses usually kind of take it from there. And, and if it's doing great, they, they release the patient to shower. And so four weeks I'd say is the average. Yeah, yeah thank you for the feedback. Can it be done I mean, bedside that, with ultrasound? You know, I am. Um, um, uh, I mean, like, as I said, I'm on our guideline, guidelines committee. We review a lot of, uh, I was published the first guideline for laparoscopic perineal dialysis access surgery. We did, we still reviewing a lot of papers. There's a lot of nephrologists inserting these worldwide, publishing on it. Um, there's some robust groups in the U.S. And I think, you know, they are, like in Wisconsin, um, doing it fluoroscopic guided. So I think there are some opportunities. If you, if you Google the, what I said, PDU, uh, PD University for radiologists uh, and nephrologists, I think that might be a way if you're, if you're the person at your institution that wants to learn that and you're a nephrologist, I think there could be a way to getting privileges. Um, then there's another question about antibiotic cream for routine exit site care. Um, I, that's not part of our protocol if the catheter is healed well and, um, and the patients are just doing normal, you know, cleaning it. Again, some of those protocols have been established by um, Davida and Fresenius. All right, excellent. Oh, uh, great presentation. All right, it looks like everybody's just thanking us for our time. So thank you again, Dr. Haggerty, great working with you. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, like I said, please feel free to reach out. We can definitely get you um, some answers if, if something comes up afterwards, but um, I'll let everybody go. Thank you again, Vasa, for helping co-sponsor this, this webinar series. Um, and I hope everybody has a good night.